Hi, I'm Dr. Amy Robbins, and welcome to Life, Death, and the Space Between podcast. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and medium, and here we explore life, death, consciousness, and what it all means. Today, we are jumping into my favorite topic, death, (laughs) with Judith Johnson. Judith is an author, mentor, and educator who helps others to raise the level of consciousness from which they are living their lives. Sounds very familiar. Her work (laughs) draws upon doctoral degrees in social psychology and spiritual science, a master's in business, wisdom teachings from around the world, and mentoring others since 1983. An interfaith minister since 1985, she also serves as the chaplain at her local hospital. As a mentor to individuals and couples, Judith guides clients in dismantling dysfunctional mental and emotional patterns so they can choose into living with profound authenticity and confidence. She also mentors the dying and their loved ones in dealing with end of life issues. Judith's third book, Making Peace with Death and Dying, a practical guide to liberating ourselves from the death taboo has just been published. It is the fulfillment of a deathbed promise made to her mother to write about what they had learned about aging and dying in a society with a powerful death taboo. This book provides understanding of causes, dynamics, and consequences of our dysfunctions in dealing with death and shows us how to break free as individuals and as a society. Judith's numerous articles about consciousness, relationships, and ends of life have been published on popular websites, and you can also find them on her website at judithjohnson.com. Welcome, Judith, to the show. Thank you. Hi there. Thanks so much, as always, for tuning in and listening to the podcast. Each episode costs more than you might think. Software tools to make graphics, write my newsletter, audio equipment and engineering, subscriptions to syndicate across Apple, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, it all adds up. In order to stay a sane mom of three school-age kids, I obviously have help producing this podcast. I have help creating it. I have help with a lot because I'm a big believer in asking for help. Um, But all of this comes out of my pocket. So if possible, I would like to continue to keep my podcast ad free, which means I would love for your help contributing. If just 10% of my listeners contributed on Patreon, I would be able to cover all of the costs of this podcast. So I totally recognize that not everybody can contribute. And what I can ask you to do if you can is to follow me on social media to rate and review the podcast. And you can do that anywhere that you listen to your podcast. There's three little dots on Apple Podcasts where you can go to any episode and rate and review. Um, Also pass the podcast along. Your recommendations are what keeps the podcast alive and keeps the podcast going. So if you feel so compelled to contribute, it would really mean a lot to me. You can do that on Patreon. Uh, just go to patreon.com and put in Dr. Amy Robbins. Also, please follow me on Instagram at Dr. Amy Robbins, at just Dr. Amy Robbins. Uh, feel free to send me any emails at team at dramyrobbins.com and just reach out. I love hearing from you and I love hearing how the podcast is impacting your life. So here we go with today's episode. Well, what we- a lovely introduction. We are kindred spirits for yes. sure. Yeah. So, so let's talk about my favorite topic. When I tell people this, they're always like, how is that your favorite topic? But let's talk about this notion of the death taboo and what, what that means and how it's become so much a part, part of Western culture, because it really is more Western than, than yes. other cultures. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I I think the best way to access it is to ask viewers to think in terms of the how do they feel when they hear the word death? And, um, you know, most of us have kind of a contraction inside of us. And if you think about the three monkeys, the see, no, hear, no, speak, no evil, that's kind of how we relate to death. That's how the that's the death taboo is our resistance and discomfort around even thinking about it. It's it's as though, well, if I pretend it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist like a Mm -hmm. child covering their eyes. 
but it does exist. And there's so much that we can do to support each other in having greater ease and comfort meeting that part of life. But in terms of where the death taboo comes from, one of the most fascinating things that I found was that it real, a part of it really originates in um, European culture and in the, um, during the Black Plague. And that was from 1348 to 1352. In that four year period, half the population of Europe was wiped out by the Black Plague. So if you even imagine, I mean, we certainly have a small reference mm -hmm. point for what we've gone through with COVID, but imagine that half the people you know are wiped out by this disease. And if you think about, this is life in a much more primitive time in our culture um, in the 1300s. And one of the things that people did to cope was they made drawings about like, you know, the images that we see today about skulls and crossbones, the Grim Reaper, those images, and remember uh, pictures worth a thousand words, those images come from the Black Plague when people made draw these drawings, put them on their clothing in an attempt to fool death into thinking, I'm already dead, you can pass over me. It was the only way they felt any sense of control. So psychologically, that's one of the deepest roots that we have, okay? Another one to look at is around the time of the Civil War was the first time that we as a country really faced um, having a lot of our loved ones die away from home. So this, began, this um, generated the popularity of embalming of bodies to preserve the bodies of our soldiers until they were transported home for death rituals with their families. And so what happened with that, along with that was this burgeoning funeral industry that we didn't have before. We didn't need it because we handled death in the home. And if anybody who is familiar with homes from like the early 1800s, they all have two parlor rooms. And one of the parlor rooms in the front of the house is designed specifically for the viewing of the dead. And, you know, because the rituals were, were housed in our homes. But when the funeral industry came whoosh, out of the house into, oh, this professional group of people now tell us how to deal with death. OK, so we, we had an abstraction of our own experience. Same thing happened in terms of medical treatment and housing of the elderly in nursing homes. We took death and dying, aging death and dying out of the home. And so instead of tending to our loved ones at home, we went to visit them in the hospital and felt awkward and didn't know how to act or what to say or what to do. So death became something outside of our everyday life. And that's how the death taboo has taken hold of us and made us so uncomfortable with it because we don't deal with it. Right. That's so interesting and fascinating. Yeah. And in so many ways, the medicalized, um, the medicalized treatment of all of this. Yes. Has the westernized treatment of all of this, right? We make everything medical and everything is treatable, even, even in the Western model of medicine, right? We, we don't even accept death when it is literally knocking at our door. That's such a huge point, too, is because what has happened in the midst of this is you have to understand that if you think about the training that our doctors go through, they, they are training is about preserving life and doing absolutely everything possible to preserve life. So if you have spent so many years and so many dollars getting trained to be a doctor, and then you're faced with a patient who's dying, how does that make you feel? It makes you feel like a failure. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of built into the system for doctors to not, first of all, they're not trained in how to support the, the process of dying, the last stage of life, they're only focused on preserving life. So when all their bells and whistles aren't working anymore, it's an awful moment for a doctor to say, there's nothing further I can do. And it's only within the last 50 years that even the concept of hospice started coming and really very recent 10, 15 years that it's become starting to become something that we all know about. And hospice is specifically professionally trained people who specialize in the last phase of life, the time in life when we're beyond medical treatment and we need to be comforted and cared for well as we exit this world. Or at least we exit our body. Right. <laughs> right. 
And I always say, you know, I think the bit, the the most beautiful gift that you can give someone is a is a beautiful death. Yeah. Um. I really. I believe that when I have had friends who have lost loved ones, whether it be parents or spouses, and they have been able to give their loved one a death in the home, if that's possible, surrounded by loved ones or in a beautiful place. It's such, it's such a different experience when you're coming into a home and you're sitting bedside and, um, there's not medical personnel constantly in and out and beeping. And I know that that can't always be the case, but it does give a very different experience to the process. It's like you are, friends are coming and going. People Mm -hmm. are, are around, you know, there's a sense of community, a sense of a feeling of love and shared experience that, that you don't get in a medical setting. But it's just like what I was saying before. It's like we took a wrong turn when we took death out of the home. Now we're bringing it back home. Because if you ask anybody, where would you, if, if given that you're going to die sometime, what, what's your best picture of dying? Most everybody will say, I want to die at home surrounded by loved ones. Mm-hmm. And that's what we all want. But 70, it's about 75% of us at least will die in a hospital setting. And a lot of that is because we don't take advantage of the opportunity to make our wishes be known legally in advance of need. And that's where the whole um, aspect of uh, doing advanced healthcare planning um, comes in. And one of the most important things that I want people to, to reckon with is you do not have to be old to die. <laughs> you know, at least a third of us die before we reach the age of 65 and all, you know, anybody. Let me tell you that even me, who's in the death space, I bristle at that. Tell me more. No, I just, it's just like, you know, you start to think about, oh my God, like 65 is not that far from where I am. Um, A third of, of a third, that's a pretty large number. That could be me. Uh, yes, I don't want it to be, but it could be. And am I? And I, I thought more recently, am I too young to start thinking about those plans? And the answer is right. No, I'm not. And here's the thing. Let me let me explain why not very quickly on this. Okay. First of all, if you are 18 years old or older, you have the freedom to speak for yourself legally in this country, in most states anyway. And given that. This is what this is about. There are three aspects of end of life planning that you have the opportunity to let your wishes be known. And if you don't let your wishes be known, then they're not known and nobody can support that. Okay. It has to do with the end of life medical care. It has to do with, I have, you know, even if it's $10 in the bank, your, your money and your stuff needs to be dispersed somewhere in the world. And then the third thing is what kind of ritual you want after your death. Okay. Most important, I would say, is deal with the healthcare. You know, usually a healthcare proxy is the document that you sign. And let me just speak to that is that that term, healthcare proxy, is both a legal document and the person who you appoint in that document to speak on your behalf if and when you cannot speak for yourself Mm -hmm. about what you do and don't want in terms of end of life medical care. And don't. When I say end of life, let me let me expand. Let me correct myself. It's not just end of life. It's any time you're out of consciousness. You might be having a surgery and you're 23 years old and something happens and a decision needs to be made, but you can't make it right then. If you have a healthcare proxy and they know what you want, then that can be honored. So okay? is it just is it just talking to them about it or literally no, it is a formal document? document. It's a legal document and you can go to go to your state, like in New York, it's newyork.gov and you look up healthcare proxy or advanced healthcare planning. There's tons of material available online and um, it's all regulated by your state that you live in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's super important. And, and you brought up another good point there is it's not just telling somebody what you want. You have to give them the authority. 
And that's where the legal document comes in. But it's important that you talk to, you don't just fill out a document, which unfortunately happens. A lot of people will go to do like, do their will and the lawyer will say, do you have a healthcare proxy? No, oh, fill out this form. You don't want to do it with, a, you want to do it with really good attention. And this is a whole chapter in my book called um, Getting Your Ducks in a Row Before You Go. I give the details of this kind of really short and sweet. But with a healthcare proxy, you want to think about what matters to me. So, for example, there are people who say, I want you to put everything on me. You know, I want every machine, anything that can extend my life. There are other people like me who say no. When I'm getting ready to die, when I'm when there's nothing further to be gained, okay, in terms of me, you know with medical treatment, let me go gracefully. Take me home, put me in bed, and let my kitties lie on the bed with me. You know, it's mm -hmm. like let me let me go, and I feel that very strongly. But I don't want to impose my views on someone else. We each have the opportunity. Use your voice. Fill out the documents. Communicate to other people. Get the get a healthcare proxy on file with your doctors, so it's in your medical charts. Give it to the person who you're appointing. You know, it's it also helps break the silence about talking about death. You know, I, I think one of the most um, that the other the other piece of 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 how we have the taboo that I I didn't mention is we live in a world that has very polarized thinking. We think of things as good and bad and right and wrong, and we have imposed that on life and death. Mm -hmm. We tell ourselves birth is wonderful, death is oh my god what a tragedy. Well, not necessarily. That's simply the value judgment that we put on those two moments of life. You know, there are other cultures that cry when a baby's born saying, oh, my God, they have to face a whole life of child <laughs> tribulations. And they cheer when somebody dies that they're relieved of life. I they're mean, if 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 death is anything like everybody I've talked to on this podcast who describes it. Yeah. Sign me up. Right. But I think that what comes in is the human experience of of what am I going to miss, right? Like we quantify mm -hmm. that with our human mind rather than this expansive sense of consciousness. Of exactly. Kind of, this is, this is just part of a circle of, of, I don't even know what, if it's a circle or a linear path or we come back or, I mean, there, there's, you know, I've talked about this in a lot of different ways on this, this podcast, but I think you're you're absolutely right is that if we can shift our mind to like death is a beautiful transition to whatever's to come which I, most people who've come back from it say it's pretty pretty effing great. Yeah. Um two things I want to say about that. One is that um Eben, about five years ago, Eben Alexander wrote this wonderful book, Proof of Heaven. Mm -hmm. Now, since my mother's death in 2006 and researching this book, I have been doing um, image searches online of the word death. And consistently, for the first 10 years of that time, the pictures were all like the skull and crossbones, all those black and white scary images or a picture of a dead body with the tag on the toe in the morgue. You know, it's like, oh, that's all it shows. OK, now around the time of Eben Alexander's book, um, and for those who are not familiar with it, he was a, a neurosurgeon who completely poo-pooed all of this stuff about, you know, near-death experiences that are beautiful looking, you know, going into this tunnel of light and all these beautiful he was, images. Yeah, he was a true, I had him on the show way back when. So if people yeah. want to listen, his story is, I think it's like episode six or seven, but yeah, he was he was a straight materialist. Exactly. And then he had the experience himself. And he's been an advocate of changing our imagery around death ever since. And, you know, it, it makes a huge difference. And something that you were just saying before made, made me think also of another important point is and this is something I'm writing about right now. I'm trying to figure out how to talk about it. Um, and, and I call it uh, um, who is I? 
you know, because we all use the word I. And when you use the word I, are you referencing yourself? God bless you. <laughs> me. Are you referencing yourself as a body and personality? Because, you know, that's what we're usually talking about. I this, I that, I the other thing. And it's not about the what comes after the word I, but who is I? Because for those of us who believe that we are spiritual beings, all right, then I is, for lack of a better word, perhaps a soul. I am a soul mm -hmm. and I am having this life experience as Judith Johnson. Now that's two very different dimensions of life. Yeah. And so when you look at it in that way, then death as we speak of it, and this was another thing that I found fascinating in my research is, is look up the word death in the dictionary and the whole definition is, is materialistic and physical. It's about the stopping of the systems that keep life in the body. OK, you know, it's like a stopping of breathing and your, your heart stops and your brain and yada, yada, yada. Well, that's all the physical body. But if I am a soul, I'm some form of consciousness that's non-physical, that's not what's dying in what we can we in our society refer to as death. And so depending on your beliefs or your openness to that, that's a great comfort if you have the belief that I, I all of me isn't dying at that point it's just this my car that i'm driving here mm -hmm. on this planet right now goes that's a very different feeling and it's one of the reasons i really encourage people think about that who are do you see a, a spiritual dimension to our existence or not that's huge yeah, and I think that that's really the make or break i mean i when i see people who struggle in grief and get really stuck. I think people who don't have a spiritual belief system around death tend to yeah. get more stuck in their grief. Right. right. Um, when you believe that there's something more, again, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make the grief hurt. It doesn't make the missing of the person hurt less, right? You're still not in a physical body, but I think it helps to accept a little bit and to believe that maybe you'll see this person again, whatever that seeing looks like, if it's not with the physical eyes, you know, trying to understand what that means to be in presence with that soul again. But it really does help in those but it, also, it also helps us on the dimension of letting go. We need to let go of one another. And when you're around any people who are well-versed in, in supporting people who are dying, they'll all tell you, be sure and let her know, it's okay if you go, I will be okay. Because not only are, do we have attachments, the dying people have attachments too, because they worry about us. And so the letting go process is about accepting that death does happen. and. And the, and the other thing is that when death is, is present, do not forget that this is your loved one who's dying. Don't focus on their dying, focus on your love for them so that they're surrounded with your love right up to the time they go over, you know, to wherever they go. But, you know, we get so obsessed with death that we forget about living right up to the very end. So very how do we know, how do we know if we're avoiding thinking about death? Like what are some of the, what are some of the telltale signs? I know you talk about this in the what book. A, what a great question. Well, Thank number you. one is how do you feel? Are you comfortable talking about death? And one of the things I would highly recommend to people, if you haven't already done so, go on a website called deathcafe.com. Look up and see if they have any death cafes in your area. And now they have them online because of COVID and everything. So anybody can go. It's one of the most fascinating experiences because we will talk to total strangers openly about death in these settings, but we don't talk to our loved ones because we are afraid of upsetting them. If you are afraid of upsetting another person by talking to them about death, it's really probably because you're uncomfortable more so than that you're afraid of them. But we keep, we have this game of that we play about protecting each other. So we won't talk about it. So if you're uncomfortable about talking about death, you're under the influence of the death taboo. OK, if you have not done things like your health care proxy, your will and things like that, if you have not taken the actions to put your ducks in a row so that if and you know that when death comes in your life, you're ready Now know that you can always update those documents. 
You know, if your ideas will change, you can update your documents, but to have one in place, if you haven't done that, you're not being com very comfortable with death. And the other good thing- Good news, is, check and check. <laughs> good, <laughs> good. And then the, the death proxy, I gotta get on that. But will the will has been done since the day we had a baby, so. Good, yes. good, good. And doesn't it make you feel better? Yeah, but it still needs to be updated. And I keep telling my husband, we got to update the well. We got to update the well. You know, you should look at it. Pick a time, you know, for a lot of people, it'll be like the first of the year. They just go through those documents once a year. Just look at them and say, is this still the way I want it or not? Okay, just get it. And that, again, is part of what it raises your comfort level is is accept the number one thing you want to do is accept the reality of death. We all do it. We all are going to die. And the more that we do to make, to raise our level of comfort around that and accept that that's a reality, the easier, the more free we are to live our lives and not live in fear. So I don't talk much on this podcast about COVID just because mm -hmm. people, you know, it's covered on enough podcasts. Yeah. And how do you think, because I have a lot of strong thoughts about this, how do you think that death um, and the fear of death kind of infiltrated our consciousness in a way that it hadn't perhaps with COVID? Well, with anything, when the quantity increases, it, it's in your face. I mean, it's been in everybody's, we have had to encounter the depth of our vulnerability mm -hmm. because every one of us who has ever taken a COVID test knows that we don't know, you know, it's like a woman taking a pregnancy test. <laughs> it's going to dramatically change my life, <laughs> whatever well, that for, is. It, for hopefully now for a much shorter period of time, <laughs> right? I think initially two years ago today, exactly almost, certainly in wow. Illinois, we didn't know what that meant. Now, hopefully we have a little bit more of a sense, but, but certainly I know every time I took one, it was like, oh God, like if this comes back positive, then what? Yeah, it has, it's part of what has, has forced us to acknowledge the reality of death. It has made death more real for all of us. Do you think we're any better off now looking at death or did death just, to, did death just become like another thing to fear even more than we were fearing it before? It depends on, um, your level of consciousness, you know, it's funny because as you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself about seeing on the news, you know, how they're doing these mass graves in the Ukraine right now, because they don't have time and all to separately, you know, mourn individual bodies. And um, both of these experiences have made this so intensely present in our lives, okay? Yes. Um, and if you are already scared of death, then you're more scared now, mm -hmm. okay? Particularly if you are one of the people who, like I have friends who had loved ones who, I have a friend whose husband was in a nursing home and she could not go in his, she could only go and put her hand on the window from outside his, you know, outside in the cold, in the snow, standing there putting her hand on the window of his room to let him know she was there. And the inability to be there for each other was so huge that my hope is that having experienced that, people will make more an effort to be there for each other now that they can. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful message. And I think that that's what, that's what death, certainly for me, and I've talked about this before on the show, this what I call a con contemplative death practice mm -hmm. helps you to do that. It helps you to really put into perspective, yeah. how do I want to be? Yeah, and this is something else that I want to mention that in my book, it's it's throughout the book, there are exercises for people to take to, you know, to do. And they're very simple. It's just all asking you to really think about how, do, what do I think? What do I feel about this or that? And the reason for that is to help you through the process of acknowledging the reality of death and, and, and getting in touch with what your own beliefs and feelings are and to evolve them to the degree that you want to. OK, but to normalize it, because otherwise it, it remains an intellectual concept. 
Well, and really yeah. what you're doing is, is exposure therapy to death. Right, yes. which would be yes. the treatment, you know, for an anxiety disorder, which, yes. Yes. you know, lots of people, I believe, I believe anxiety often at its core is anxiety about death. Yes. Um, right. Because it's often about control. And ultimately, the thing we usually most want to control is whether or not we're going to live or die. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, is the fear of flying the fear of heights, maybe, maybe it's being on a plane, maybe it's, you know, but ultimately, at the core, it's likely about not being in control about whether or not you live or die, heights, you know, spiders, all of these things. Um, And so it seems like in so many ways, that's what you're proposing here. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So what you have so many great exercises in the book. Um, What is the what do you feel like are a few, if you could just highlight maybe oh my one or two that are the most effective. Oh, I don't even know where to begin. Um, for example, this is one that I love, is my deepest beliefs, okay? This is actually on page 95, if you wanted to look. Document your responses to these questions. You can come back to them later, but for now, begin to record and date your present perspective. One, what really matters to me deep in the core of my being? Now, how many times do you bother asking yourself that question? You know, this is why it's like an interruption of your normal course of events to get you to stop and think for a minute, please. Two, what are the five most fervent beliefs that inform how I live my life? Three, am I pleased with myself as a human being? How do I think I'm doing being me? Ooh, that's, cool. that's an intense one. Yeah, four. that really forces you to look at yourself. Exactly. And that's, that's really, uh, four, what is the most profound purpose of my life? Okay. And number five, do I, do I think life is precious? Why or why not? And how is that apparent in how I live my life? Okay. Um, in every case, what I'm asking you to do is make contact with yourself, Stop running and racing around in the outside world and go inside to yourself because that's the one who's here living, (laughs) okay? And instead of running as fast as you can, stop. Take ownership of who you are and what matters to you because the more that you can engage from that place and live from the inside out, the more enjoyable your life is going to be. And you're not, you know, we spend so much time trying to measure up to some elusive external standard of what we should look like, how much money we should make. In the, in the, in the final analysis of anybody's life, those things end up not mattering a hoot. What we really, really care about is did I love and was I loved? Mm-hmm. That's what really ends up mattering. And, you know, in my own experience, my mother and I shared a home the last nine years of her life. And I came out of that experience knowing in a way that I never knew that I really am a, a heck of a, I am a lovable, good person. Mm-hmm. I, pre- I demonstrated that to myself in how I handled that situation. And so even an awful situation like caring for a loved one who's dying can really give you such treasures in life. So don't shy away from them. Dive in and be there for each other. That's what matters more than anything. Well, and I think you don't have to wait either. No, I know. I just, I think I was just sharing with you before we got on. I just spent the weekend in Arizona. Um, my parents, my father just retired and they rented a place for a month. And I don't think since I was three years old, I've been alone with my parents. Wow. Just me and my parents. I mean, wow. I'm sure that I have, but not certainly not that I can remember. <clears throat> and obviously, I mean, they are very youthful and they're, my mom's turning 70. My dad's 73. He just retired. Oh. They're very youthful, but any moment, any of us can be gone. Um, I just don't mean them. I mean, it's probably more likely that it's them than me, but right. one third, one third under 65. Um, yeah. And, and really that was, a proponent of me going is, yeah. I don't know how it makes me want to cry even saying it. I don't know how much time any of us has left here. And we spent all day, we spent three, I was there four full days. I had four full days with them. 
we hiked, we went for dinner, we laid at the pool, we did wordles, we laughed. And that time to me like, is, is so sacred. It was like, I felt like, can I bottle this up and yeah. save it? Yeah. You know, um, this is such a good segue to something that I'm dying to speak of here. And that's Go what ahead. I call the legacy journal. And um, for those that aren't familiar with it, think about this. You know, we've had this this upsurge in interest in genealogy, you know, and oh, find out who your great, 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 great grandfather was and blah, blah, blah. And so we're we're at the stage of kind of understanding of researching the family tree and being able to get the information of who was related to whom at what time and blah, blah, blah. But imagine if you could put some breathe life into that by actually knowing stories of these lives from the point of view of the person who lived them. And that's the purpose of a legacy journal. And it's hugely important because imagine, you know, we meet each other in roles in our lives, like somebody is your mother or somebody is your sister or your brother. And there are certain social constraints that those roles bring. But when you get inside somebody's own experience, and for example, I know my brother and I have a little game we play with each other when we get on the phone these days, as one of us will mention Cedar Brook Park or something like that. And the other one's like, oh, you know, has to bring up all their memories about Cedar Brook Park. And it's, it's really fun. But one thing I want to mention is that in, 19, in 1990, there, some clinical uh, psychologists did some research about how important it is for children to know where they come from. Not necessarily the specifics, but um, these people created this list called, do you know? And it's a list of 20 yes or no questions. Like, do you know this information or that information? Not what it is, but do you know that information? And what it's a whole, they take the results of this test with children and combine it, correlate it with a, uh, the bat, with a battery of psychological tests indicating um, that the more children knew about their family history, pardon me, I'm reading this from my book, the more children knew about their family history, the stronger their sense of control over their lives, the higher their self-esteem, and the more successfully they believed that their family functions. And what was key about this is that this scale has turned out to be the single best predictor of children's emotional health and happiness. So write down your stories. There's also a website called storyworth.com that'll send you a question every week. Um, and, and at the end of the year, you get a bound book of your answer, you know, of all your answers. It's a wonderful way to do that. And one of the things I recommend is that families make this a family project. It's like if your family, when you were together, all made a list of let's all answer these questions this year, you know, and you all answer the questions and and put them in a document together so people can get to know what is it like being you mm. you're the only one who knows i love these ideas gosh there's so many great takeaways from this interview today uh, thank you I, I don't know if you would like to read it but i would love to end this with what you write at the end of the book which is this beautiful poem death is nothing at all uh, yeah. People may have heard it before, but if they haven't. And before I, before I read that, if I could mention one other thing. Absolutely. If, um, that if anyone wants to reach out to me, yeah. um, they can do so at my website, judithjohnson.com. And one of the services that I offer is I do offer end-of-life mentoring services to help individuals who are facing death or loved ones or grieving ones. I help through that process. So feel free to reach out to me. Perfect. And as everybody knows, all of this information will be in the show notes as well. So people will be able to find you on my website and everything. So well, why don't to talk to oh thank you <laughs> so death is nothing at all and and I, I i just want to preface it by saying this was actually delivered as part of the sermon entitled death the T king of terrors in 1910 while the body of king edward the seventh was lying in state at westminster and my mother asked me to read this at her funeral okay um, death is nothing at all. It does not count. I have only slipped away into the next room. Nothing has happened. Everything remains exactly as it was. I am I and you are you. And the old life that we lived so fondly together is untouched and unchanged. Whatever we were to each other, that we still are. 
that we are still. Call me by the old familiar name. Speak of me in the easy way which you always used. Put no difference into your tone. Wear no forced air of solemnity or sorrow. Laugh as we always laughed at the little jokes that we enjoyed together. Play, smile, think of me and pray for me. Let my name be ever the household word that it always was. Let it be spoken without an effort, without the ghost of a shadow upon it. Life means all that it ever meant. It is the same as it ever was. There is absolute and unbroken continuity. What is this death but a negligible accident? Why should I be out of mind because I am out of sight? I am but waiting for you for an interval, somewhere very near, just around the corner. All is well, nothing is hurt, nothing is lost. One brief moment and all will be as it was before. How we shall laugh at the trouble of parting when we meet again. I need to take a minute, pull myself together. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just want to say, um, my being to, being a caregiver to somebody you love when they're dying is a great privilege, and you will learn things about yourself that you might have been afraid to encounter. That you will find out what how much goodness you have in you and what you're capable of. Don't 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 run the other way. Run towards where it's happening. And open your heart. Just keep opening your heart and breathing into the experience and saying, I accept this is happening. I'm going to do my best with this. And some days you'll do a great job and some days not so much. And that's okay. Isn't that life? <laughs> yeah. Right? Life. Some days that's you life. do a great job and other days not, not so, so much. much. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Judith, thank you so much My for pleasure. your time today, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. It was really certainly enlightening for me, and I live in this space pretty frequently. So I'm sure that for others, it will be too. So thank you very much. And for thank anybody you. who is interested, the book is Making Peace with Death and Dying. Buy it. Both <laughs> holding it. Go buy it anywhere that you can on Amazon, I'm sure, bookstores, but it's got great, great exercises in it just to contemplate. And, and also, I think it really spans like this notion of before we die, planning for death, thinking about death, when we die, like no matter where you are, there's something in this book for you, no matter where you are on the spectrum. Maybe you've not, not even thought about death and you just want to buy the book and that's your exposure right now. And you're just going to keep it on your nightstand for a while. <laughs> but whatever it is, this is, this is a wonderful, um, almost guidebook, yeah. I would say. I really appreciate your support. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. Be well. Enjoy your life. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Judith. Bye. Like what you heard today and want to hear more? Wondering what comes next and what it all means? Head over to Apple Podcast, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you get your podcasts and hit subscribe. Also, if you could take a minute to rate and review my podcast, I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned as we continue to explore life, death, and the space between.